and I have a mic guy here. So uh, what we do is that you raise your ha hand. I think we have room for two and maybe three questions. Raise your hand, state your name and where you're from, and your question. We have a question over there. And if you're popping on a question, you can sign to me while we, our mic guy is running. Hi, my name is Per Strömbeck. I work for the Swedish games industry. My question is for Henrik. Um, how do you see the role of the author changing when um, the content opens up to user interaction? Do you see uh, something like what Alex from King described, where you can use metrics and analytics to change the content? Will, will there be novels in the future? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think there's been a lot of more data-driven decisions in publishing the last kind of two to three years than ever before, if you sum it up. Um, I think the best example um, that is it's speculation, but that's kind of the industry is in, in, in um, um, uh, it's kind of saying that it's true, is that the Amazon released something called Kindle Singles, which is a shorter book um, that, they are, um, that they're releasing as kind of a special type of, of content. And, and this decision to focus on that was made because of they could see in the metrics that people were not finishing mm -hmm. a lot of the books that they were buying. Um, so that was kind of the kind of one of the first kind of projects that that that, that were um, that were based on kind of a data-driven decision. And uh, I mean, the the role of the author is changing a lot. We're seeing a huge democratization in 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 in, in how people are reaching new audience, audiences of readers across the world with self-publishing and so on. So um, I mean, will the will data have a very important play a very important role for authors in the future, definitely. And uh, we'll Just to add off the back of that, Fifty Shades of Grey is a really interesting case study for that question because that was released digitally first and then the conventional book deal happened second. Yeah. So it exploded on people's Kindles yeah. and then it became a conventional book in the stores that you could that those 90% of book buyers buy and don't read. But uh, sure. yeah. And it's also a fan fiction. Mm. I mean it's written as a kind of a side story uh, to the vampire movies. Uh, so that was the origina originating kind of story, what do they call it? I forget mm -hmm. what they're called again, but um, uh, yeah. So, so it's d definitely interesting case study to check out. Yeah. Is, is there to continue on that? Is it uh, uh, affecting how people are creating music? Um, yeah, I think in music it's slightly different from books and games. One of the things that's fascinating with games is if you're a developer of a game and Apple is going to take 30% of your revenue off the top to get there, do you need the publisher? Or what does that do to the role of the publisher? Similar story in books, similar questions being asked in music. There's a lot of hype and hysteria about how to answer that, but I think it simply comes down to a classic make or buy question. What can I do myself and what do I need another service provider to do for me? Mm. And I think you know, authors, musicians, games developers are just asking that question in their own unique way. I mean, in a lot of these uh, online situations, you've got uh, very strong network economics at play. So you have one or two dominant distribution channels where, you know, getting that viral uh, impetus is incredibly important and therefore you need to work through third parties even though, uh, theoretically, you could publish directly on the web, uh, which is, then ends up being a very expensive route. Mm. And before I continue asking, I, we have a question down here. Where is them? And we have one here. Uh, so we need you on the mic, so, so we get it on, this, on the screen, streaming as well. So your name and where you're from. Okay, my name is Johan Marnfeldt, and I've been working with eBooks as well. So I have a question for Readmill here. Uh, how is your economical model? How do you earn money? Right. So it was extra interesting to do this presentation because our economical model is data. How do we deliver an extra value to publishers and authors around the world uh, with interesting insights on actually how people are consuming books? I think the statistics about like 90% uh, of the books purchased is not read by the person who buys them is super interesting. It means that the whole model of tracking who is actually your consumer when mm. it comes to books is totally out the door. We need not to track who is buying books, but who's actually reading them. Thank you. 
Uh, well, uh, he's asking how Readmill is making money. Yeah, so uh, it could be to deliver insights um, and to license insights to publishers and authors around the world. Um, I mean, a, a, point, a point on this is that the economic models for traditional publishing are changing. I mean, if you look at the games industry, you see console sales going down, revenue from free to play games going up. Uh, we've had the same experience in the music industry where traditional retail sales primarily through piracy have, have collapsed, uh, digital sales going up, a question is whether the industry will reach in terms of gross revenue where it was in the 70s and 80s. So, you know, the change is definitely very, very strong. Mm. And Will want to add to that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, two very quick points. One, I invented a very sexy term for what Henrik was describing called exhaust economics, which is all the data that comes out of the exhaust pipe of incumbent firms. New firms like yours can grab and put little nickels and dimes on them. And I think it's an exhaust economics business model in terms of data is where the monetization happens. The second point to, to what you just heard there is when industries expand, the wheels start turning again. So when I go back to that Swedish example of more Swedish bands getting some more Swedish fans in Swedish, which is a very encouraging story, one of the drivers there is that Spotify has allowed the Swedish music industry to expand you know, year on year. Whereas most markets are shrinking, this one is growing. And if it's growing, those labels can invest in more talent, that more talent can get to more fans. And it's just that self-reinforcing principle. Well, that depends how you define yeah. the music industry. Mm -hmm. So if you include live music, yeah. yes. But if you're talking about recorded music, I'm not sure. Well, certainly for the UK, that's, that's not the case. Sure, and I'll just add to that as well. What makes, and this is a bit of an exclusive, um, what makes Sweden particularly fascinating is not only did the music industry expand by almost 20% last year, but its live industry, and it's not great economic times that we live in, expanded by 12% as well. So, you know, a rising tide is lifting all boats. And I think with this, uh, um, you leave me with an impression that uh, you're all quite positive uh, against or against about the development within each of your fields. Is that the? I mean, sure. It opens up a lot of new opportunities for. I mean, especially these guys are a bit older than I am. You can see that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, for for new for new entrants in a, in a, in, a, in a market. For old entrance is yeah. also very good too. <laughs> you like the behaviors that are going. And we're actually out of time, and I think some people want to have lunch, but we have the pleasure of having you staying around for a while. Yeah, so absolutely. your targets to be addressed if you have more questions. And thank you very targets much and enjoy lunch. <laughs>